All right, everyone. Welcome back to the Have It All podcast. Super, super excited. This is like uh, when, when you meet your uh, one of those legends on the street and they just happen to be here on the interview. Uh, we're here with Dr. John Demartini. So first of all, welcome to the show. Well, thank you for having me. It's uh, been looking forward to it. Pardon my, yeah. my glitch in getting on here. I was, I was a little untech savvy, savvy for a moment there. Well, we're, we're, we wanted to do this live on Facebook and that didn't happen either. So it just must be one of those uh, tech days, but um, <laughs> guys here as well. So we're, we're going to be here together and um, yeah, just really excited to get to know more about your story and about what got you here. Um, before we jump into all of that, just so people know a little bit more about your background and how long you've been doing this in this space, uh, you know, you, you put Guy and I to shame in the length of time that you've been here and we've been around for quite some time. So uh, I'd love for you just to share a little bit about your background and story before we jump into all the, the other goodies. Well, I'm, uh, what I do is I travel around the world and I'm a, a teacher, a researcher, a writer, and uh, that's been my dream since I was 17 and I'm 65 now. So 47 years I've been, I've been doing this and um, I can't think of anything else I'd rather be doing than learning everything I can and traveling to every new place I get to go and share whatever I research in a way that helps people maximize their potential and, you know, expand their awareness of potential and do something extraordinary with their life. And I know you know what that's like because you do the same and you try to help people do something extraordinary with their life. I love that. Yeah, we're, we're like 30 years behind you. So it's like, you know, like look, looking into the future for us right now. Um, I'd love to know when you were 17, you said something really happened. You, you it became your dream. What, what happened that brought you? Because back then, I mean, personal development, all that stuff was not really what it is today. I mean, how did you fall into it and how did this become your passion? Well, I was on the North shore of Oahu, mm -hmm. which I'm going to in about two and a half weeks to surf pipeline there. I, um, I was living on the North shore. I was a long haired hippie surfer boy <laughs> and um, expanding my consciousness to natural means. If you know what I'm talking about, <laughs> I have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> I was, I nearly died. And, um, for three and a half days, I was, I was unconscious Whoa. and I, I nearly died. And a lady found me in my tent. I was living in a tent and a lady found me in my tent and helped me recover, took mm -hmm. me to a little health food store. And at the health food store, I was leaving that store one day and I saw a little flyer on the door saying special guest speaker, Paul C. Bragg, Sunset Recreation Center, uh, Waimea Bay, Sunset Beach Center. And um, something intuitively said I ought to go to this thing. I, I, I was never one person that would go to an evening talk. I was a high school dropout. I didn't even know how to read. I had learning problems. I didn't learn to read until I was wow. 18. But I just something said to go to this thing. And um, I attended this class with this elderly gentleman named Paul Bragg with this woman yogi. And uh, that night, that man in one hour with one message, that one night really got to me. And for the first time in my life, I, I thought maybe, just maybe I could overcome my learning problems, mm. my speech problems. And uh, I can maybe someday become intelligent. Wow. I never ever thought I was going to be intelligent because I was, I left home when I was 13. I was a street kid. And I was, I had dropped out of school because I couldn't pass school and I had dyslexia and learning problems. And I had to go to speech pathologist starting at age one and a half because I couldn't use my muscles, in my mouth properly. And uh, so I didn't read. I just, I was, Semi street smart, you know, living on the streets, but academics wasn't it. But after meeting this guy and what he said was so inspiring, <laughs> so inspiring that he made me believe that I could overcome this learning problem and someday learn how to read and learn how to be intelligent because I didn't want to be a dumb. I was in a dunce class when I was in elementary school. And um, that was the night I saw a vision 
of me speaking in front of a million people. I didn't have any idea that was going to pop in my head. But that was, I have that, I, I wish I could bring my computer, I, I'd do it right now. But in the other room is a painting of that vision. Mm -hmm. My favorite painter, he painted it. And it's a, it's a painting of me standing on a balcony in front of a million people with every major icon building from every major city in the, in the, around the world in the background. And it's about sharing a message of the world that from your heart that you want to share that's inspiring to you that you want to share and inspire the people with. And that was the vision I saw. And this guy painted it. He did a magnificent job of it. And ever since that night, I've had a dream to step foot in every country on the face of the earth. I've been to 153 countries now. And, and, and to just take my research, whatever I did learn, and whoever would listen to share and that's led me to doing a lot of talking. <laughs> wow. That was, that was a, but I had to first, when I first left Hawaii after that, I first had to learn how to read. Hmm. That was uh, with the help of my mom, because I went and moved home and I started reading a, a, a dictionary and we started memorizing 30 words a day and pronouncing them, spelling them and using them until my vocabulary was strong enough to be able to read a book. And then I started to read 18 to 20 hours a day. Now I've read over 30,300 books, but at the time I just, it was, I couldn't read. And so I was trying to get that thing in gear and my, um, I never stopped. You know, if you, if you stay with something long enough, <laughs> everybody else eventually dies in Europe, there's, you make it. <laughs> Amen to that. Can, can I just ask, what was the message that, I think you said his name was uh, Peter Bragg, what was the message that he shared that really resonated? Well, he said that we have a body, we have a mind and a soul, and the body must be directed by the mind and the mind must be guided by the soul in order to maximize human awareness and potential. Hmm. And that you need to set goals for yourself, your family, your community, your city, your state, your nation, your world and beyond for 100 to 120 years. And that, you know, that your innermost dominant thought will become your outermost tangible reality. So what you think about most becomes real. And what you think about, what you visualize in your mind in full detail, what you say to yourself and how you feel about yourself changes your destiny. So he gave me a little affirmation. <laughs> I told him, I said, you know, I don't know how to read. I, I, and I had a vision of being a teacher. How am I going to do it? I don't you know how to read. And he gave me a little affirmation. He said, every single day, say this statement to yourself every single day. Never miss a day for the rest of your life. He says, if you say this every single day and never miss a day, sooner or later, the cells of your body will tingle with it. So will the world. Hmm. And I said, well, what do I say, sir? And he said, say, I'm a genius and I apply my wisdom. And I thought, I didn't even know what a genius was at the time. <laughs> but I later learned that a genius is one who listens to their inner voice and follows the inner vision and lets nothing on the outside interfere with the calling on the inside and prioritizes their life on a daily basis. And if you fill your day with high priority actions that inspire you, your day doesn't fill up with low priority distractions that depreciate you. And if you fill your day with challenges that inspire you, it doesn't fill up with challenges that don't, that don't inspire you. And I just learned to prioritize my life. I started living by priority and started building incremental momentum. And I, once I learned how to start to vocabulize and then start to read, slowly but surely people started to ask me questions. And it was one of the most inspiring. I had a 375 pound Afro-American woman want me to teach her yoga. That was my first student. <laughs> <laughs> then I had a, then I had a, Persian gentleman watching me out, sitting out in the sun, meditating. And he said, can you teach me meditation? So that's my second student. And by the way, he's still with me after 47 years. Mm, wow. And then I have um, a, a class got out and asked me to teach him what little bit of mathematics I was learning. And man, I had such an inspiration to be able to contribute to somebody else's life. Yeah. What I was learning that I was like, you know, there's no way I'm turning back on this. I'm going to master this thing. And I remember I failed my first class in college. I was devastated when I tried to go back. I had to take a GED, a high school equivalency test, then an ACT, then a college thing, and I just failed. And I just, I got a 27, I needed a 72, and I went home crying, and I was laying on, a, on the floor in the living room, and my mom saw me, and she said, what happened, son? 
I said, I blew the test. I guess I'll never be able to read. In first grade, my teacher said I would never be able to read, never be able to write, never be able to communicate, never be able to mount a thing, never go very far in life. And I reiterated that to her. And she didn't know what to say. And finally, she said, son, whether you become a great teacher, healer, and philosopher and travel the world like you've dreamed, whether you return to Hawaii and ride giant waves like you've done, or you return to the streets and panhandle as a bum like you've done, I just want to let you know that your father and I are going to love you no matter what the hell you do. Mm. And when she said that, my hand went into a fist. I looked up and I saw that vision. Mm. And I said to myself, I'm going to master this thing called reading. I'm going to master this thing called study and learning. I'm going to master this thing called teaching, healing, and philosophy. And I'm going to do whatever it takes. I'm going to travel whatever distance. I'm going to pay whatever price to give my service of love across this planet. I'm not going to let any human being on the face of the earth, not even myself, interfere with this now. Mm, And I hugged my mom and I went to my room and I got that dictionary out and I was relentless in the pursuit of memorizing that dictionary. And that led me to reading 18 hours a day, 20 hours a day. And my vocabulary expanded and more and more people were interested in what I had to say and learn. And I just never stopped. And I started teaching every friggin' day and I've been doing it ever since. And I started around locally, and then it went to around the city, and then around the state, the nation, and now around the world. Now I get to do it as I envisioned it when I was 17. And, wow. I'm, and it's just growing at greater speeds now than it ever has, so I'm very grateful. Wow. It's amazing. That story was uh, with your mom is so incredible, because uh, one of the things that, that we work with clients on, we have this, uh, you know, m- most people never, never got that message, right? So, like, we grow up. And we just try to effort and do and work at getting that love and acceptance from mom and dad. Um, and one of the things that we do with clients is we have this concept. It's like where you, you get to be that parent that your inner child never received. So in that moment, you were needing that. You didn't get that. But you can, you can replay that and do that today. And one of the things that we work with people all the time is that you don't have to do anything to receive love. That's it. And when yep. the system gets that and your little boy or girl gets that, it, it, it's like you said, it, it sets you free. So hearing that an actual parent was emotionally in tune enough to deliver that message to you at that time, it's like, yeah, it's well, my, tingles all over. I, my mom definitely had an impact on me there. I, um, you know, I, cause I just never thought I was going to be intelligent all the way through till 17. Yep. I was a surfer. I was make. there was a guy named Dick Brewer on the North shore who was riding, making all the big guns, all the big wave riding boards. And I was, you know, sanding his fiberglass with that guy and doing whatever I could to learn it. Cause I assumed I was going to be a professional surfer. That was, that was my goal. Mm. But when I saw the vision that night, mm-hmm. when, when, um, when Paul Bragg was speaking and he had us go through this visual experience for about 20 minutes, I'm guessing, I don't know. It was kind of a transcendental timeless moment. Sure. When I came back out of that vision, I looked around the room and there was not one dry eye in the room. Everybody saw something for their life. I never got to meet all those other people to find out what happened in their life. But I just know that that vision was so real that virtual reality was greater than reality at that moment. Mm. And that vision is indelibly in my mind. And those were the vision flourish. Mm. And I'm absolutely certain that that had a, an impact on how, why, I'm, you know, I've been relentless in the pursuit of this, you might say this master plan of mine. But I think that, that many people, see when we live by priority, our blood glucose and oxygen goes into the executive center of the brain, the forebrain. And in that area of the brain, there's fibers, nerve fibers that go up into certain regions and awaken inspired vision and give opportunity to do strategic planning and have a desire to execute the plan. And you have self-governance because it creates glutamate and GABA transmitters that stops the amygdala from distracting you. And you just get focused. And that I tell people how important it is to get clear about what they really value and prioritize their life. Because if not, you'll subordinate to the world on the outside and uh, not honor the magnificence on the inside. 
And a lot of the people compare themselves to others instead of comparing their daily actions to their own highest values. And they envy other people and try to imitate other people, which is sort of a suicide of their own magnificence. Mm -hmm. And they don't honor what their calling is, their metier, their, their mission or primary objective or whatever you want to call it, chief aim, whatever, whatever the name is, if you honor that, you unfold the great leader that you have inside and then no, nobody's missing this magnificence. But if they subordinate to other people and try to live in the shadows of others instead of stand on the shoulders of giants, they're going to miss out on their own magnificence. I liked in one of your videos, you said that um, when you allow yourself to be yourself, the, the only person you're competing with is you. So there's no competition. Exactly. That was really beautiful. Um, I'm, I'm curious now, having been in the industry for so long, um, Yelena and I have been around since right around the same age as you echo a lot, a lot of the same sentiments in terms of experiences and what led us here and the types of vision and things we were dealing with, um, things of that nature. So we're, we're very lucky to be blood brothers who are, you know, on the same path and have a similar vision and creating a company around that. Um, certainly I know that there are things, uh, even in the past few years that I, I held as a, a, like a strongly held belief, even though uh, I think if you've been around this work long enough, malleability is part of the game. Uh, but certainly in the last few years, we've dug much deeper into energetics, subconscious programming, metabolizing energy in the body. And that kind of opened up a whole new world. Um, not to say that it doesn't placate well with what we were learning before, but it kind of was like, okay, this is, this is not enough. So we, we're kind of in this place now where we see that people are doing the good work. They're doing the personal development work. They're understanding how their mind works, the phenomenology, the psychology. However, there's not enough information in this world, right, to stop a person from seeing something in their environment that doesn't make them feel safe and then have a, an energetic response to it. So that shifted the work quite a bit for us when we started looking at, well, how do we actually work the energetics? Like, how do you work that response so that you're not managing yourself 24 hours a day, which turns into a lot of shoulds and you know uh, attachments to how we're supposed to be or how we think we're supposed to be. I'm curious, uh, having been in the industry as long as you have been, what even now are there things that are continuously surprising you that you had a long held belief that is suddenly shifting, and, and what would that be? Well, I think it's been an incremental um, adaptation. You know, you can't read and learn and and get mentorship and attend programs without incrementally learning bits and pieces along the way and put a puzzle piece to, you're putting puzzle pieces together kind of sure and some universal design emerges as time goes on <laughs> and, uh, but you know if you every human being has a set of priorities a set of values that they're living their life by moment by moment and it's unique it's fingerprint specific and whatever's highest on that value list they're spontaneously inspired from within intrinsically. But as they go down the list of values, it becomes more extrinsically motivating to get sure. them to do those things. Sure. A video game uh, for a 12 year old loves his video games. Doesn't need to be reminded to do it, but you got to remind him to do his homework and chores. Mm -hmm. So whatever that thing is that spontaneously wants to emerge within you, if an individual lives congruently with that, they have the most resiliency and adaptability because they have the most objectivity. And if they're living by some lower value system, they have the most polarity. And because they're unfulfilled, and when they do, they look for immediate gratification to compensate for the unfulfillment. Mm -hmm. And that leads to living vicariously through other people's brands instead of building your own brand. And that also leads to a consumerism, a kind of a prey-predator model where you're looking for prey and trying to avoid predator. And the reality is life has a pair of opposites. So anything you're trying to avoid, you keep running into. That's right. And the, as the Buddha says, the desire for that which is unavailable and the desire to avoid that which is unavoidable is a source of human suffering. But when you finally embrace the prey and the predator and understand the, the, the two sides of life are both necessary for you to master your life, and you don't try to be the hero without the villain, you got to embrace all of it. That's right. Um, your life is more fulfilled because you're not trying to get rid of half of yourself, trying to love yourself. And a lot of energy... You know, when you infatuate with somebody, they occupy space and time in your mind, and you're too humble to admit what you see in them is inside you. When you resent somebody, they occupy space and time in your mind, and you're too proud to admit what you see in them is inside you. And if you're too <laughs> humble or too proud, you're not being you. You're exaggerating or minimizing you instead of being you. So when you judge people, you disempower yourself and distract yourself and become preoccupied with external things. 
instead of going inside and letting the voice and the vision on the inside be louder all that, than that. So it's so important to live by priority, objectively, according to what's valuable, where you can incrementally grow, where you have the most adaptation, because it's constantly changing. And you got to give yourself permission to keep doing extraordinary incremental steps. And some people want overnight immediate gratification instead of building momentum incrementally. I'm the kind of guy that just kept doing it little by little. And, and now it's, it, it's bigger increments. That's all. Yeah. For 46 years of overnight success. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> as, as you know, uh, you know, there's some goals that I've had for many, many years. I had goals to have students from every country around the world starting mm -hmm. in 1982. It wasn't until 2016 that we now have on our, you know, our database, literally people from every country known. Wow. So it, it took 30, whatever it is, years to get there, 34 years to get that goal met. But so what? You know, exactly. It's not, not the destination, it's the journey, the fulfillment of what you become in the journey anyway. But I'm just grateful that I, I, I never stop on those goals. I just keep going on the goals, even though some of them are afterlife goals. I have a posthumous biography of how I want to be perceived a thousand years from now, and I'm working on those goals. Wow. And some of those have already come true because of it. It's quite astonishing. Now, can I share an interesting story? Absolutely. Sure. So I was in uh, Rome teaching my signature program, The Breakthrough Experience. This is 1999. And um, at the end of it, a lady named Antonella asked me if I would like to go on a tour through Rome before I left in the afternoon the next day. I said, certainly. <laughs> so she took me on this beautiful tour and we ended up right around the lunchtime finding this square about the size of a soccer field covered in red rose petals, hmm. the entire thing, millions of red rose petals, all barricaded off. In the center of the square was this beautiful marble base with this bronze statue of Giordano Bruno, who was a theologian, philosopher, astronomer, mathematician, that lived 400 years earlier, and who had burned the stake for his teachings that we lived in an infinite universe with infinite beings, with infinite worlds. And uh, the church at the time was challenged by that because they were indoctrinated by Aristotle and Ptolemy about a geocentric world, and this guy's coming up with a heliocentric world like Copernicus, and he's revolutionary. So they imprisoned him and eventually burned him at the stake. And right before he was burned at the stake, they gave him an opportunity to speak and say anything. He says, do you want to recant? If you do, you'll go to prison and won't die. Do you want to recant your statement? He says, no, but I do have something to say. I'll bet your fear in lighting this torch is greater than mine in receiving it. For though you may destroy my mortal body today, you will never destroy my immortal message and soul. And today you will release my message to the world, which is my mission and spooked him a bit with a, his certainty. Well, he, before he died, he wrote a posthumous biography of how he wanted to be perceived and what he wanted to accomplish 500 years into the future. Hmm. 400 years from the day they killed him, the same organization is now honoring him in that square for being 400 years ahead of his time as a genius. So when, that, when I did that, and I'd read his posthumous biography, so I knew that was so, and it was such a, an inspiring moment to be capturing that. So on that flight, when I left, I got on there and I, I went to work and I wrote a 23 page posthumous biography of how I want to be perceived a thousand years in the future. And I mapped it all out and I saw it and it was like a, a, a Tom Cruise, Jerry Maguire, automatic writing, inspirational tier kind of thing, you know, yeah. just came pouring out of it like automatic writing. Hmm. And it was like, I was transported into, into another century, looking back at my own fulfillment. Well, then I went about my business and I read that and refined it and read that and refined it because I'm a believer in refining. My, my, my goal book is 5,000 pages of re constant daily refinement. And um, 2009, I was asked to speak at a Walzell conference where 200 leaders were gathering together and 12 individuals were presenting. I was one of them. Muhammad Yunus was another one, Nobel Prize winner. Um, Paul Nertz, Nobel Prize winner, Dalai Lama was one. So it's a really interesting group of people. And I was asked to present my conflict resolution system that I've used now recently with is Israel and Palestine. And I was introducing this, this thing here to this, this pre presentation. It's a, a three-day presentation at the Melk Abbey in, in Austria. 
it's like a Sistine Chapel room. And at the end of it, on Saturday night, they, they uh, took all the speakers and put them in a semicircle and handed them a stainless steel cylinder. Hold on, I'll reach up and show you what I'm talking about. This is just a replica of it. But they, they gave this, this stainless steel cylinder. Okay. And this is, a, a like I say, a replica of it. And they handed it to me, and then all of them got the stainless steel cylinder. What it was is 365 quotations and the Demartini method, uh, conflict resolution model and method, calligraphied on scroll paper, Ooh. ribbon, told, just rolled up together, stuck in this stainless steel cylinder. It was air vacuum sealed, so there's no way there's anything in there to erode it and to destroy it. And then we marched down to the end of the library that we were having the ceremony in, went into this Infinity of Divinity library room where this 12-foot Infinity of Divinity uh, library shelf was, and it was a, a vault, a vacuum seal vault, and we got to put our materials into this vault to be stored for a thousand years. Wow. Wow. That's incredible. So I'm a believer that, you know, we go around and we say we're immortal souls, but we don't write immortal goals. Mm. Seneca, the, the Roman poet, emphasized how important it is to set goals that are centuries, if not, you know, at least generations into the future, because you'll, you'll be more stable and steady. It, if you're looking at a white line in front of you when you're driving, you'll wobble all over the driving. But if you look miles ahead and you look at a mountain or at something, you can drive steady. So people, the magnitude of space and time and the innermost dominant thought will determine the conscious evolution that they've obtained. And it's important to have a, a vast vision that you chunk down into daily actions, but you can still see the vision because it makes you stable and less volatile and less distracted from the world on the outside and let the soul's calling on the inside guide you to do something extraordinary. Yeah. I'm a firm believer that that, that posthumous biography that I wrote literally manifested that, that reality. That is such a cool story. Um, you know, I, as I listen to you talk and I've watched your videos and um, you have a quality about you that's very unique. And I'll, I'll say it this way. People, most of the time, are either very logical or they kind of can work in the world of the ethereal and the spiritual and all that stuff. It's very rare that someone kind of has both of those qualities together. And my experience of you has always been that you, you have this way to marry the two. And one of the biggest things I see where people are very logical, they, they tend to get stuck in a world of needing to understand more. So someone that reads thousands and thousands of books generally will entertain someone at a dinner party by spouting off all sorts of you know, quotes and this and that, but there's very little as lived experience, right? They can sound smart, but they're not living from that place. You've somehow, taken, you know, amassed all this wealth of knowledge, but you really master it and experience it and live it. I'm, I'm curious, you know, has that always been, obviously like you, you thought of yourself as, you know, someone who's an idiot mm -hmm. back in the day, but how did that transpire? Like, what do you do to take that understanding and actually drop it in and make it more experiential? I had a dream uh, God, I, we, you got a couple of years. Let's, let's get going. <laughs> I love your stories. So for you. We'll listen all day long. Mm -hmm. um, Wealth of wisdom. Yeah. You know, when I failed the test and I, I went and started reading about months later, I, I don't know because I have to think about how many months that was just about four or five months later. I, my mother came to me and she said, son, you know, what do you want for your birthday? Cause I was born on Thanksgiving day. And she said, what do you want for your birthday and for Christmas? And I looked at her and I said, Mom, I want the greatest teachings on the face of the earth, the greatest writings humanity's ever created from the greatest minds who ever lived around the world. Hmm. And she said, you sure you don't want a T-shirt? <laughs> <laughs> I said, no, Mom, I could give a hell about a T-shirt. Yeah. Clothes don't mean anything right now. I, I want to gain wisdom. And so um, she contacted her, her brother, who is my uncle, Uncle Ralph, who was a professor at MIT and a chemist and physicist. 
And as a gift, he sent two giant six by six by six foot wooden crates of books to my parents' house. Mm. And I remember the flatbed truck came in and they unloaded it on the ground and I got a crowbar and I went out there and opened up all the crates and then carried thousands of books into my room. And I, I started devouring them. It was, there's an overwhelming number, but I just said, I'm going to organize this and I'm going to start knocking these babies out. Hmm. And um, one of them I came across was by Paul Dirac, a Nobel prize winner on his teachings on quantum physics because he was he and Schrodinger were involved in that Heisenberg and I started to do that now every other word was a dictionary I had to pull out right. <laughs> and I started about it. and then I came across a book by Godfrey Wilhelm Leibniz or Leibniz and um, the discourse on metaphysics in the first chapter first paragraph he basically said, and I'm, I'm nutshelling it. He said, there's a divine perfection, a divine beauty, a divine order, a divine love that few people ever get to know about. But those that do, their lives are changed forever. And I could not stop crying when I read that. Mm -hmm. I just said, there's something here. I don't know what it is, but I'm going to find out what this is. And I'm going to be one of those individuals that understand this. And I'm going to find a science to help people find that, experience that. And I'm going to spread that across the world. Wow. And I, um, and I took the idea from Paul Dirac that for every particle, there's an antiparticle because he's the one that took Einstein's equation and it, which had a plus and minus symbol in front of the e equals MC squared. And he's the one that said, well, that has to be matter and antimatter. So he created this matter and antimatter construct. And I studied everything there was on physics. I mean, I've devoured God knows how many books in that area. I wanted to know what that was. I wanted to know what entanglement was because I had a sense that that was the secret. Girolamo Cardano, who is a, if it wasn't for him, there would be no Schrodinger's equation. There'd be no quantum physics. He was a statistician, probabilistic statistician back centuries ago who came up with a square root of negative one, which had two roots, positive and negative, which is necessary for the charges on particle and nanoparticles in quantum theory. And I went back and devoured his work and devoured every lineage all the way through to Schrodinger and these guys. Wow. And they believed, he said that the only way to know God was through the square negative one. Wow. <laughs> so I wanted to understand the math of that. That led me to study the history of mathematics and study thousands of mathematicians to try to find out what he was talking about. I now know what it means. Actually, the, the union of science and religion is a mathematical equation, actually. And it's, it's, it's a perfect equanimity within the mind. Hmm. So the study of mathematics, which is abstract and conceptualized all the way to infinity, is designed to help us discipline our mind into a state of a balanced equanimity. Because hmm. then there we have no judgment. Empedocles, a pre-Socratic philosopher, said that there were four elements. And he said that there was love and strife in the universe. And strife is when the elements are dissipated. And love is when they're integrated. And when an individual asks the right questions to the mind and becomes fully conscious of their unconscious information, so they fully see the bigger picture, they are in awe and they have equanimity and they're poised and present and purposeful and, and they're productive and prioritized and they're, they're extraordinary individuals and, and they, they, they see the divine order and they're so grateful for their life and they're so inspired by what they do that they, they create an innovative, you know, original thinking that changes the world and it contributed on vast proportions and i I've, I've been in the pursuit of that understanding and so the science and religion to me are not separate yep. and thought and feeling are not separate because a perfectly balanced thought gives you an inspired feeling and so there's a math to this there's an elegant mathematical journey here that i've been on pursuit on max planck who who you know gave rise to his planck's units he he understood this he knew there was a of intelligence in the universe. Einstein said it's enough for me on a daily basis to contemplate for just a moment that intelligence that permeates the universe, almost a panpsychic model there. And so I've been interested in exploring every friggin' discipline, 300 disciplines, to uncover that magnificence so people can have that as a guiding mechanism to fulfill a calling that they don't even know they have inside, yearning to express itself from the heart and soul to into society and humanity.
Beautiful. Beautiful. Bro, do you have a question? Yeah, I was going to say, uh, John, I'm both like um, highly inspired by an individual like you living on the planet. I'm also a little bit sad because I know the amount of investment of time it takes to develop oneself into like such a prolific human being that can see different angles from different sides. There's many of us who've taken time to master a specific area of life, but we haven't really expanded out to look at so many different aspects to actually see that it, it's ironic when you master something and then you pursue the mastery of something else, all you see is the same journey that you took the first time, right? It looks so much the same. So I, I love it. And I, I agree for me, it's a, uh, we're kind of living in an integral time or starting to move towards an integral time where a lot of these things that have lived individually are starting to find each other and, and see all the parallels between the two. And I do think science and certainly quantum physics and um, spirituality, or I should say quantum physics is catching up to spirituality and spirituality has been saying this stuff for thousands of years. So um, yeah, thank you for sharing that incredible vision. I, I'm wondering now, um, like, so what's your vision for the world? Like how, how do you, what is it that you would want to see change? Because you've lived through a period of time of the change, right? It's like, like 50s and 60s saw this incredible uh, uprising in consciousness and people exploring suddenly and breaking away from the more orthodoxy and traditional way of being. And then 80s, 90s and 2000s have been this really big take into really creating one of the biggest industries on the planet, which is people wanting to find safety, well-being, consciousness, connection and spirituality in a new way. Um, what would you like to see with your remaining time on earth happen? Like what, what's the vision? <laughs> Well, when I when I depart, I'm planning on selling Ouija boards so people can still listen to my seminars. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, take, I'll get I'll get the pre-orders. Are they going to be like holographic? You know, like... I love it. <laughs> Great answer. Um, <laughs> you know, there is such a there's such a hidden order in our life that we don't see. As, as Dirac said, that it's not that we don't know so much; we know so much that isn't so. There's so much magnificence in our life that we don't get to see because we haven't learned the questions to unveil it. Mm. It's, it's not so much about what needs changing. It's more about helping people realize the magnificence as it is. Cause, because you can't bring order if you can't see it. Yeah. And so I'd rather unveil it and help people realize it. Cause in the breakthrough experience program that I do, I have people coming in with all kinds of stories. Sure. You know, I was, I, my mom abandoned me. This happened to me and I was raped by this. I, they always have a story. And when I get through with them, they're all they're in is just grace. Cause I asked them a new set of questions and helped them realize that everything there was on the way, not in the way. And there was nothing there except a, a poised cheer of gratitude for, I wouldn't change a thing. Anything you need to change in your life that you regret, you're not grateful for weighs you down. And I tend to think that, that we sometimes project assumptions about how it's supposed to be instead of right. honoring how it is. And I always say depression is a comparison of your current reality to a fantasy you keep being addicted to. And, and, it, and I think that the world is more magnificent and is doing fine. And it's human beings that just haven't realized <laughs> how fine it is. We haven't caught up just yet. We haven't caught up with the, with the order there because after studying, you know, 300 different disciplines, I am... Um, I, I, all I see is a, is a magnificence. And I, mm -hmm. and it's, it's, I love sharing that with people. I love helping people realize that they've never screwed up. The only time you think you've made a mistake is when you've injected the values of authorities that you've given power to into your life and compared your actions to other people's values. And the only time you think well, people think other people have made a mistake is when you projected self-righteous, your values onto others and expected them to live in your values. That's right. But when you have equanimity and equity, there's no projection or injection. There's just equity and there's a, a deep transformation. You know, our mind, anytime we're infatuated or resentful and judging, our mind is occupied and distracted by that. Because we've all been in highly infatuated or highly resentful and our mind can't go to sleep. And so the universe is trying to tell us to get centered. Because wow. in that moment, we have free, a free mind, free, clear mind. That's right. The same thing in business. If we're, not, if we're talking down to our customer and our employees, we'll end up with a revolution in our employees and a, a re rejection by our, our customers. And if we're looking up, we'll sacrifice our profits and margins. We got to come into equanimity. And in our in finances, Warren Buffett says until you can manage your emotions, don't expect to manage money. As long as you're cocky, you'll tend to over 
you know, leverage. And if you get humble, you're afraid to buy. So you undermine your wealth. And in relationships, if you're cocky or humble, you don't have communication and dialogue. And in leadership, you can't lead because you're, you're run by the things you're misperceiving. And in your physiology, you create illness. So you're not inspired unless you're in equanimity. So when I, when I realize that the universe is constantly offering us feedback in a magnificent way to help us get to the most authentic, objective state we can be in, but we can get addicted with our amygdala to a fantasy that doesn't exist and trying to avoid a nightmare that doesn't really exist. And we're missing out on the magnificence. And I, I'm interested in helping people see that yes. and help them realize how magnificent they are and the people around them. Because when they do, they come from a different perspective and they want to contribute to the planet, not from a fixing, but from a sharing of love for what they get to do. Mm. Gorgeous. Can I, can I ask you something on a more personal level? Yeah. So as someone that's, that's done all this work and continues to do all this amazing work, what are, what's the world, what's the world putting uh, on your way? As you said, I love that on your way, not in your way. What are the things that you're working on personally for yourself that you're uncovering? Cause I, I find it so interesting. Sometimes we look at someone and we say, you know, they have life figured out. I've been around enough humans to know that we're all just in this dance, figuring it all out, right? So I know that you're human, having your human experience, and part of that human experience, like you said, is all of it, both sides. So I'm curious, you know, for you, what's the thing that's right now you're uncovering for yourself? Well, uh, before I answer that, I'll, I'm going to put it in perspective, because sometimes, go. many times I run into, depending on the country I'm in, uh, people that have subordinated to somebody who they thought were enlightened or aware or something like yes, that. Absolutely. I like, to, I like to go by Einstein's idea of living holy curiosity, not the illusions of enlightenment. And, um, you know, I, I take to think of a, a, you're a tiny speck on a planet that's in a hamster cage going around in a circle on an orbit, you know, 24,000 miles around in a, in a day, thousand miles an hour, basically. You have a very small domain you work in. Even if you're in a rocket jet, you're still a small domain. And then you look at 93 million miles away, one astronomical unit to the cent center of the sun, and you look back at the Earth. You can't see it unless you've got a telescope. And you can imagine sitting on the sun, looking out at the Earth, and it's spinning around, you know, and, and you hear this guy who's in a white robe with long hair, and he's going, I'm enlightened, I'm enlightened, I'm enlightened. <laughs> and then, then you go, you know, 27,000 light years away to the center of the Milky Way, where Sagittarius A, you know, black hole is. And you look there and you look back and you, you can't find our solar system. There's too much gas and dust in the way. And um, then you see that solar system going around, you know, every 210 million years. And there's that little guy going around there. I'm enlightened, I'm enlightened, I'm enlightened. <laughs> and then you take that, you, 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 you take our Milky Way and look at the local cluster in the, in the, and the, look at Virgo cluster and all the satellite galaxies, and then you realize, okay, you know, our Milky Way is insignificant. And then we go and realize that that whole thing is moving towards a strange attractor, you might say, a, a, um, a great attractor in the Launikea supercluster, which means a measure of heavens. And then you realize that that is nothing but a tiny speck in the giant cosmic web. And that's just a piece of the observable universe that we use in the deep field telescopes. And then that helps you realize that the infinity that's before us gives us an infinitesimal awareness. But yet at the same time, when we look at the other scale down to Planck's dimension, we realize that we're immensely popular and powerful. And so it keeps us centered and makes us realize that it's about a journey of growth, not that it's done. And anytime you think it's done, it's, it's delusional. Yep. So in my case, I can't wait to get up in the morning and see if I can add another piece of the jigsaw puzzle together. And the jigsaw puzzle, every time I put another piece in there, I find out it's one of the holographic specs in a bigger friggin' puzzle. And I, and I, so I just go for the journey and I just keep learning. I'm constantly learning, you know, every day. I don't go a day without researching something. And it could be on physics or cosmology. I got 19 different co co leaders in their field send me stuff on anthropology, medicine, you know, physics, cosmology. They're all coming in. And I, I, I last year I wrote a, two big volumes on astrophysics, hmm. about a thousand page, 500 page textbooks on astrophysics. 
And then this year I got an opportunity to be in a movie with Stephen Hawking. I'm like, whoa, that's amazing. You get, you get, you focus on the topic and you manifest people in the field. And, um, you know, so the universe gives you what you concentrate your thoughts on. And, um, so I'm just constantly learning about everything I can, anything that will help, um, help people see the divine magnificence of what's going on. Like Leibniz said, man, I'm, I'm in it. And that's, I, I don't think I'm going to stop that. So I don't have any, I don't have any rationale looking back saying, well, I'm going to stop that. I thought at one time that I was, my final chapter would be, you know, international six symbol and I would take over Hugh Hefner's position, but <laughs> there's been no evidence of that whatsoever. So I, I realized I better stick to what I'm good at. You know? <laughs> Elon and I are willing to hold, just hold that thought for you in the field and see if that pans okay. out in the next few years. Um, I'm, I'm curious. So like, obviously, you, you know, you're, you're astute. Uh, I mean, I don't know if you have, you consider yourself with like a picture perfect uh, memory, but it, it seems like you can recall quite a bit from everything. So, I'm wondering like right now, right? So obviously there's this, like the educational side, these thinkers, people who've really stretched the boundaries and of what's possible and they stretch what we're thinking and the ideas that we're bringing through all the time. How much do you give? Um, I mean, I can't imagine that you don't, but how much credit do you give to just mystical experiences? Well, I've had my share for sure. Um, I, I learned that if I'm present, um, we, I, I say... Immanuel Kant, the German philosopher, said that there was an imminent mind and a transcendent mind. An imminent mind is that which is inseparable from the neurology and the reflexes and the conditioned, unconditioned reflexes. But the transcendent mind transcends those and has a capacity to abstractly conceptualize infinity and to have this synthesis and synchronicity of awareness at the same time where pairs of opposites are joined together in this superposition, as we say in quantum theory. And this transcendental, I've, I, I've worked on a, a, the science and how to wake that up. And I've, I've mastered that science. I know how to I can take anybody to that state now with, with the methods. And so it's asking the right questions because the quality of our life is based on the quality of the questions we ask. If we ask questions, it allows us to access the pairs of opposites in every moment of perception. As we pass through life, we're literally on a stream of consciousness and we have Planck's dimensional slivers of time in each of those experiences. If you take each one of them, you'll find out that there's a, whatever you're perceiving, the equal and opposites in your awareness, but one's conscious, one's not. If you see both of them at the same time, you realize there's been nothing but love. All else has been illusion in your life. And when you do, you realize there, there is a magnificence. And then, and then you're now given the opportunity to have an infinite variety of experiences, love at all scales of existence for eternity, which is a magnificent place um, to perceive life from. Yeah. And so I, I'm a, I'm a firm believer of, of delving into that and sharing that and helping people realize that because they're, they're, you, can't, you can't go back from that. And so I'm, I'm, I'm working on that. <laughs> Amazing. And you're, you're, a fa you're a father, right? Of... Uh, three, of, three that I'm aware of. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> in, the long... 60s, in the 60s, who knows? Yeah, sure. and, and you were a surfer, so really, who knows? Uh, <laughs> how, how does this, all, all this education, I know I'm a father, guys, a, a recent father. My, my kids are eight and six and a half, so they're young and just kind of like getting into this world of understanding where I can feel like I can share some of these experiences and lessons where they actually obtain it. I'm curious, from, from your perspective, passing this, knowledge on to children like how has that been your experience as, as a parent as well well there's two things that come to mind when you say that one was a quote by albert einstein that says the greatest teacher is exemplification and then a quote by cahill gabron in a sense and i'm paraphrasing uh, they come through you not to you oh so, amen to that so they're, not, they're not mine to own they're yeah. mine to just observe watching and, and then exemplify now, I happen to have my three children here with me. They're here. They, they all were working in my office today. Mm -hmm. My daughter is taking over the thing and is saying, step aside, Grant. She's taking over. My other one runs the fashion company, the Demartini Fashion, if you look. <laughs> the other one is a YouTuber and does video games and, and is, is getting a you know, following and stuff. And um, my only commitment was to see them find their calling and fulfill it. 
and whatever that is for them. Yeah. To exemplify living an inspired life, because if I did that, they would learn through their mirror neurons and their chameleon understanding and not try to tell them. Uh, and, you know, many times when we're trying to rescue other people, it's representations of parts of ourselves that we're trying to rescue. And we're projecting our own wounds onto other people, thinking we're caring, but we're just projecting. I don't have those wounds, so I don't try to project onto how they're supposed to be. More so, I'm interested in helping them uncover their magnificence. Hmm. So they, they're doing great. So I'm very grateful for that. But I don't see that they're, they're mine. They're theirs. You know, they're, they're, they're their individual beings. But they, they, for some reason, like to hang out with me when, when I'm in town. <laughs> Thank you for sharing that. That was magnificent. That, that hit right there. That was gorgeous. All but you'd have to ask them. If, I, if you want me to get them, I'll get them to come in here and they can say hi I to you. Love, I would love to hear, <laughs> hear that, yeah. Hold on a second. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Let's get them. Super inspirational. Yeah, just wow. It's been, a, it's been a while since I've sat with somebody and really wanted to just let them talk more than even ask them a question just because of the, the pleasure it is, yeah. John, it's good that you have martini in your name. You really are just like a, a fine drink. <laughs> <laughs> I think my, my son may have just stepped out, but I think my That's two okay. daughters. So they're good. Yeah. Hi there. Hi. Yeah. See him? I'm sure you get this all the time, right? People taken by your father, but it's uh, wonderful. So he wanted to meet the byproduct yeah. of the man. Yeah. Where are you guys, where are you guys based? One's in Europe, California. Yeah. We're, well, we're hello from Houston, yeah. Texas. <laughs> <laughs> what was your name? So, this, is, this is Brisha Aurora, and, and she is the fashion designer. And yes, I'm the designer of his suit alongs, which you're probably square real quick. Yeah. Very cool. <laughs> and, and I don't where's Elena? Elena. <laughs> Amazing. Oh, she's in yeah, she might be in a console, but. No, no worries. No worries. No worries. Let's see if you can get her. Oh, so <laughs> cute. Oh, now, now, here's my son, the YouTuber. Hey, how's it going? There. What's going on? Oh, you yeah. guys are spitting images of each other. Yeah. Wow. Lot, yeah. And what's, yeah. Your, what's your name? <laughs> what, what's your name? This is Daniel oh, oh. David. Dan, Dan David. He, he was, we were in Tokyo recently and together and um, he was on the, he went to Akibara. Yeah. And yeah. he's, uh, he loves no, video games. That's just, that's just love. Wow. <laughs> He's like, yeah. <laughs> okay. So hold on. So real quick question, right? So like you obviously started playing when you were really, really young. Yeah. Yeah. Like, so yeah. as a father, cause I'm, I'm going through this right now. Right. So my son's like eight. So as a father, you're, we're around all these other kids and everyone's like, okay, I got iPads. I got this, I got that. And every parent has an opinion about like, you can only play for this amount of time and this and that and blah, blah, blah. I'm curious, like how are the experiences together? Because Obviously, dad is all about you find your magnificence. And if purpose, magnificence yeah. is, hey, let's you get to be magnificent playing a video game. How did that create balance? Like, how did you guys entertain those those interactions? Um, I mean, I, Come on, Lena. I was always, uh, I, never, I never saw him uh, that much when I was younger. Like, when I first got started into gaming, but um, I mean... When, when he was young, he lived in a different area, and I was traveling much of the time. But but you've been doing videos since you're three, right, four? Well, I don't know. Like, probably around like seven or eight. Like, seven? Like, yeah. yeah. Like your kid. So it's, um, but I mean, he's, he's always supported anything I like, whether it's music or video games. And just recently, I just decided, hey, if I can make a living playing video games and meeting new people and all that. about your experience. Tell yeah. me about your, the Playful and, Philosopher blog, you know? Yeah, doing blog. Yeah, he has his own blog. That, it calls it the Playful Philosophy. He takes philosophy because he loves philosophy and he puts it also with the video games and he tries to take the essence of the game and the principles of what it impacts on life. And wow. he shares it. Yeah, it's cool. Wow. That's very cool. We'll put that yeah. in the show notes for sure. That's very cool. Wow. Super Time. cool philosophical aspects of video games they're there it's not all just <laughs> mario and jumping around oh, and for stuff. sure I, yeah. mean, I think that industry yeah. is going to have significant influence over this next generation so to position yourself there and not as somebody who just wants to be an entertainer and that if that's fine if one does 
Yeah. Uh, but I think to use that platform to say something is really meaningful. When I was, yeah. when, when Dan was younger, when he was like 16 or 17, I asked him if he would help me with some things. He said, what's that, dad? And I said, I said, well, I've got some philosophers. I want you to summarize their lives and their biographies. So he used to write up these philosophical summaries of the great philosophers. I figured that we all win out of that. You know, I win, he gets to win, he gets to learn and stuff. And he would write these papers. I still got one of these papers he wrote that was just mind blowing. That's amazing. It's a, it was an amazing paper on, you know, great philosophers. Hmm. So cool. Beautiful. Wow. Thank you, you guys. guys. On the video games. He, he's, he's, uh, he can see in the video games, just like I see the magnificent series, he can see in the video games things that many people don't see. Yeah. One of, one of my uh, good friends just became, now there's a whole legal aspect to e-gaming that, you know, there are no attorneys to control any of that stuff. So now there's this whole like e-game world that's developing with basically like athletes and colleges training these athletes and all these things. So there's all these criteria. So he wanted to be in that world and kind of placed himself in that world. So now he works with all these, you know, all the, I don't know the names, but like all the top teams and things like that. He was telling me it's like one of the biggest industries I it's the in the world today. sporting industry in the world right now. Yeah. 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 So well, you're well positioned. I, I didn't really grasp the significance initially of the video world. Yeah. It was a little bit outside my, my radar at the time, but now I realize it's, it's huge. My gosh. It's huge, and, and, and he's at the forefront of it. And I'm, I'm, a, I go on his show sometimes, and and it's quite funny. I'm, I was doing a video game one time, and uh, I was trying to do it, and I'm like a klutz, right? I'm, you know, <laughs> I, I know how to tell you the volume of a doorknob with calculus, but I don't know how to turn the doorknob. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm, I do this video game, and this kid, probably I don't know, ten years old or something like that, gets on and says, "Idiot, let me show you how to do this." Yeah. <laughs> I'm doing the square root of negative one over here. <laughs> well, That's incredible. You know, keeps it all balanced, you know. That's it. Yeah. It's so beautiful. <laughs> Amazing. Dan, how old are you? Oh, uh, 28. 28. 29. Super cool. Next month. I think I last I looked, video gaming is bigger than all four major sports it's in this right. country combined, right? Yeah. Uh, that's from a revenue perspective. Yeah. Yeah. Incredible. Yeah, he wants to get in on that. So he's he's building up his followers and his subscriptions and doing all the things. And then he's got a his master plan ready. And it's happening. He's a different world. It. Different world. Yeah. Yeah. He, he's gonna be he'll be bigger than me in about at one twentieth the time. Yeah. <laughs> YouTube is YouTube is a hell of a marketing uh, platform. So yeah. Yeah. Well, isn't that, isn't that what's exciting about these times? You know, like John, I look at someone like you, right? And it's, uh, there's some circumstance and I, and I do believe there's divinity in all this, but again, looking for more of the human perspective, right? There's a, a certain circumstance has you perceive reality in a certain way. You start achieving in a specific way. And, and all these like perfect things have to come together. We see this with Mozart. We see this with Einstein too. And in today's world though, a lot of, a lot of the education that you've invested so much of your life, you know, putting together, will kind of be more accessible or more readily accessible through algorithms, software, whatnot. So mm. we're going to be a very idea based society. But for me, it's like what I, I, when I look at the future and I think about what makes me excited is not all the drama that we see on TV, but rather the technology that's going to allow for a genius to arise on the planet in a way that it's never happened before, where someone like you says, Hey, my son can do what I did, but he'll do it one twentieth of the time. And given that we only have, you know, X amount of time on this, uh, on this plane of reality, to me, that's the most exciting thing because what else could the future be but everyone claiming who they are and then having a platform to actually lift themselves up and say, here I am and look at my genius and for whoever this connects with, like I'm over here. So I try to think like 20, 30 years out from now, like what this world's going to look like. And it, it's exciting. It really is. Yeah, it's so beautiful. It's, a, it's amazing. Definitely. I want you to meet my other daughter. This is Elena. <laughs> <laughs> Best interview ever. Hi, Hi Elena. Hi. <laughs> Okay. Get them on. Get all three so we can get them. Aww. <laughs> three here. Cool. <laughs> I'm in here. Hold yeah. on. Is this, so, is this a family I first? Have you guys ever all been on a podcast together? I don't think so. I think this is the first time all three. I, I, yeah, I think this is the first time. There you time. go. Cool. Magic. Not all three together. But Elena is the one that says, step aside, Gramps. I'm taking over. taking over, baby. So <laughs> she's, she's just waiting me to, you know, turn to, to glue factory. <laughs> Use the Elena, so, so you tell us, you tell us at what point <laughs> we get to do them. 
in the afterlife, I'll be sending messages back to her and she'll be teaching. The delegate. Yeah, I'll still be delegating from the afterlife. Yeah, but, but, with the Ouija board. Yeah. But, but, <laughs> That's right. Uh, Elena teaches uh, the, the programs also. Mm. She's out there with me traveling the world and teaching too. So yeah. it's pretty inspiring. But all of them are doing their, their, their mission. So it's very inspiring to watch the, the cool. work. But they all help me also in the, they, they look, you know, you need help, dad. And, and so you know, you're, you're, you're not going to make it without our help. So they, they basically come out and make sure that I get it. Uh, that's true. That's, that's true awesome. for all of us. We learned that real slow, how to meet yeah, our needs, how to ask for support. I don't know how to, I haven't driven a car in about 30 years and I haven't wow. cooked in since I was 24. I've delegated all lower priority things. You know, I've, even my girlfriend says, I want you to delegate sex to a, a, to a professional. to know what they're doing. Easy now. Easy now. <laughs> the, the kids are here, dad. The kids are here. <laughs> I think that's amazing. Yeah, they're used to me. Oh yeah, that's not even an yeah. issue. But, but I love it. Interesting. But it's interesting. I learned to delegate everything except what my core competence is. And he even learned to have children to run his business and put us to work. It was already inefficient. That way I get a return on my investment. That's it. That's it. Uh, <laughs> investment. Uh, our dad, our dad just put us behind the lawnmower. It just turned out he didn't have a lawnmower business. So that didn't help at all. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I thought about naming them ROI as their, their names. Uh, <laughs> oh my God. A-D. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's Brisha. Elena, Elena and Daniel. Daniel. So they always use that against me. And they say, well, you named this bad. So you, what said the it, you set yourself up. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you guys are amazing. Wow. Yeah. I, the whole thing started because I asked your dad, I said, you know, how was it being this figure where you're very public and then being at home and interacting with kids? Because it's a very different thing. Like I have a eight year old and a six and a half year old and they're just getting to that court where they can kind of you know they see us on youtube they this and that and they start asking questions and it it brings up very interesting conversations and i think given the background that we have in personal development and spirituality we we have different conversations than i think their friends have and i'm always curious from their perspective like what's that going to look like 10 years from now and so we kind of started going and he's like well all three are actually here right now and so it's just very cute and Wow. Awesome to see you guys. Yeah, I, you know, I, 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 since I was very young, I, I read Epictetus, who was a philosopher, that, who made a quote that about Socrates. Socrates was not a man of his local area, you know, Corinth or Athens or whatever. He was a citizen of the world. And then uh, Einstein said, I wasn't really a, a man of my community or city or state. I'm a citizen of the universe kind of thing. Mm. I've always believed that I was destined to have a global view and that my home was the world. I live on a ship called the world, in case you don't know that. And I sail around the world on the ship and that is the world. And so I've always said, that's the home. So I'm never away from my kids, no matter how far away it appears, I'm always living on the world with home. Mm -hmm. and so instead of walking to room to room, we'll, we'll fly. And instead of, you know, talking and you know, whispering, we'll Skype. We have a global perspective and now I got, you know, global family. So that, that was my dream to have a, 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 a a global family, not just a local, you know, little suburbial family, because I thought that was too constraining. Amazing. That's beautiful, wow. guys. So great to meet the whole family. Like, what oh, a, what, you guys. Guys. Thank you. What a beautiful thing. Oh. And I'm going to go look you up on social yeah. media. Have it all. What, what do I look it up? Because I'm going to tag you on my Look up, Satori, look Prime. up uh, Satori Prime is the name of the company. Satori Prime. Okay, Satori, Satori Prime. Prime. Awesome, guys. Amazing. Uh, so Very great to inspiring, meet you. guys. Uh, amazing. I'm going to come out and find you wherever you are, somewhere in the yeah. world, and we'll come, uh, we'll come join you for an event, John. Wow. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I don't know where to go from there. So <laughs> I think, <laughs> um, Dr. Martini, I just want to personally say that um, it's interesting. You know, sometimes you meet people that you've seen on videos or read books or et cetera, and you're like, eh, you know, it's, it's this scripted thing that they do and they just, they know that specific lane so well. Uh, being in your presence today, like even when you went to get your kids, Guy and I were just like, it's rare that you come across someone where you're just wowed by the presence. It's not even the stories and all that stuff. It's there, there's um, a beingness. Yeah, there's a beingness yep. that you have that is incredibly inspiring to me. I know it's a guy too. Um, 
I, I'm just honored to have had this time with you. Oh, well, thank you. I can feel the same way. I, I'm an absolute certainty that you can't see something in somebody else that you don't have. So that's that just, I'm glad that you honor yourself that way. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Um, is there, bro, I don't know if there's anything you want to say, but I'd love for him to share, you know, anywhere. Is there anything you want to say real quick or? I honestly, I have two words, literally. I just want to say thank you. Not, okay. not, not for, not even for being here. That's wonderful. Just, just thank you for who you are, what you're doing in the world. Thank you for how you show up. Thank you for the people you've served. Thank you for the vision. Thank you for honestly giving me a little bit of downloads in my system too. Some places I can, I can see that I'm playing way smaller than I know that I'm capable of. So thank you for that gift today. I'm, I'm, I'm really going to sit after this interview and, and feel into some things. And um, honestly, I look forward to finding you somewhere in the world and coming to shake your hand. Yeah. Great. Fantastic. I, I yep. can say the same and thank you for that. You know, you said something about a script about, 36 or seven years ago, this guy attended my program that I was doing one night. I was probably 28 or nine or something like that. 28. And um, this guy comes up and he says, hey, I'm a, a professional actor. Can I work with you and help you with your script? And I said, well, I don't know. Wait, tell me, I don't even know what to say. So he comes and does it and he tries to get me to do this script thing. And I said, you know, I must not be a good actor because the scripts don't mean anything to me. I speak from my heart and I right. can't tell you what I'm going to say one billionth of a second before it comes out. Yeah. I, don't, I, I just know I've got a message inside that, that wants to come out. And, and he said, You're, you'll, you'll never make it as a speaker. <laughs> I said, well, thank you. I appreciate that. Can you, tell me <laughs> you can't speak, man. I said, okay. Yeah, it, it's, it, you know, it's strangely true obviously in the marketing world as well we've had people come up with these amazing scripts and and do all these things and it has never i mean no matter how many times we have tried it has never worked for us for the same reason it just it feels inauthentic at the deepest core it's like i'm trying to be something in that moment that energetically i'm not whereas when we get to just rap and be and be present and and aware it just flows when i when I, I i pulled out the oxford dictionary many years ago 30 40 years ago and i went through and encircled every known behavioral trait that a human being could have in that because that was the most comprehensive dictionary i could find mm. and i found 4628 traits that i circled then i put the name of the individual who i believed displayed and demonstrated and exemplified that behavior more than anybody else that i knew out to the side, initial, real tiny print. And then I looked in my side myself for where I displayed and demonstrated that trait 100% to the same degree as I saw in that most extreme example. And I discovered that there was nothing missing in me. <laughs> I, I had every trait. I was kind, I was cruel, I was nice, I was mean, I was positive, I was negative, I was honest, I was dishonest, I was playful, I was serious. I was uh, everything that I, uh, I was a hero and a villain and a saint and a sinner and a virtue and a vice all in one package. And then I realized that the th things that I thought were bad ones, I looked for the upsides of it. The things I thought were good ones, I looked for the downsides. And I realized that the light and shadow delusion of that narrow-minded morality wasn't true. And I realized that we need all those. That's why everybody has them all, but we have to learn to own them all. Mm -hmm. At the level of the essence of our soul, nothing's missing this. At the level of the existence of our senses, we think things are missing from us because we're too proud or too humble to admit it all. But when we finally admit it all, wow, what a freedom. Because people can't push our buttons with it because we already own it. That's right. Can't be whole so if all the parts don't come with you. So beautiful. Uh, Dr. Demartini, where can people find out more about you or listen well, to if, you? If they want to, <laughs> they may not want to after <laughs> me. <laughs> but if they want to, they can simply go to drdemartini.com. And that's an educational website. They could probably spend their, they could, you have to believe in reincarnation and Buddhism to be able to, to, to spend time on this website because it'll keep you busy for a couple of lives. <laughs> and, and, uh, but there's lots and lots of videos and, you know, shows and radio and television, newspapers. I write for like 1400 magazines around the world. So there's a lot of stuff on there. And so there's, uh, you know, it's an educational experience. So they can go on drdemartini.com. They can find out whatever, you know, I am. And there's plenty of videos out there. Amazing. Beautiful. Amazing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you again for, for being uh, here. sharing this amazing gift with the world, our listeners, with us. Uh, it was an absolute honor. No, thank you. I can say the same. So appreciate it. Thank you, brother. Beautiful.
All right, everyone. We will try to top this. Don't know how on the next Have It All podcast. Have a great day, everybody. Thank you.